Meanwhile, on the opening day of training camp for his 14th NBA season, LeBron James said that the retirements of future Hall of Famers Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, and Kevin Garnett caused him to ponder when he and his contemporaries' final games will be. It feels like our era is next. That's what it feels like. Me, Wade, Melo, Bosch, we're next. We on deck. That's what it feels like. Yeah, we on deck. We're the next group behind those guys. I mean, if you look at it seriously, we're the next group. So uh, that's the, one of the first things that I thought about. Like, you know, once Dirk and Vince and Paul Pierce decide to go, we're, we're next. So you just don't take it for granted. Every time we come out here, we talk to you guys, we step on the floor, we're going to play this game. We love it. Um, you know, but we're we on deck. Crazy to think of it that way. James signed a three-year extension with the Cavs this summer. Max, how many more prime years do you think LeBron has? Let me be very clear about this, Stephen A. We are still in the LeBron James era. He just proved it in the finals. Mm -hmm. And yet, LeBron James has already exited his prime. LeBron James has been in decline now for several seasons. It's a testament to his greatness that he's falling from such Olympic heights that even in his descent, he's still better than everyone else. But let's look at the facts. ESPN, Hoops Hype, various other places have chronicled his statistical decline. In, in his peak, which you could say was the 13-14 uh, season in Miami, he's finishing 75% at the rim. Now it's 65% in the same area. Decline. The three-point shooting is down. His defense is not what it was. Now, can he turn all that stuff on when he needs it most? Yes, he can, because he's like a pitcher who comes into the league throwing 100 miles an hour all game, who gets to the age where he goes, okay, look, I can still bring the heat. I could throw 100, maybe 98, but uh, I can't do it all game. I got to pick and choose my spots, which is why he's compensated for the athletic decline with increased mental awareness and greater understanding even than he used to have of the game. He's, he's balanced the two, so he appears to the naked eye to still be in his prime, but he's not. He understands that he needs to bring his players along with him. I got to get Kevin Love involved. Okay, that's not working. We need to look for mismatches, then get Kyrie going. He'll do whatever it takes, so he's compensated. Like Muhammad Ali in the second part of his career, where it wasn't the Ali who beat Sonny Liston and Ernie Terrell and Cleveland Williams anymore. That was peak Ali. But he had his greatest victories in the second half of his career, post-exile, against Joe Frazier and George Foreman. Precisely because he wasn't at his physical best anymore. He had to compensate in other areas to keep his game at the height. And because he wasn't the greatest anymore, he was able to achieve his greatest victories. And LeBron is in that phase in his career. Evidence. Who was the regular season MVP three years ago? KD. And he deserved it. LeBron in his prime. No one deserved. When he was in his prime, no one deserved MVP, regular season or otherwise, over him. Is it because he's taking his foot off the gas in the regular season? Of course. He's saving it for the playoffs. But, in the, but years ago, especially those two years in Miami where they went, went, went back to back, LeBron didn't have to take his foot off the pedal in the regular season. Floored it the whole way, beginning to end. Now he has to adjust what he does because he's not at his best. Who won the MVP the following two years? Steph Curry, regular season, deserved it both years. When Michael Jordan was in his prime, did anyone ever deserve the MVP over him? No. When LeBron James was in his prime, did anyone ever deserve even the regular season MVP over him? No. But he has exited his absolute peak, and so now KD deserves it, Steph Curry deserves it, Steph. Still the LeBron James era can turn it on where he needs to, to, the, to, to people who are casual observers. Oh, he's still at his best because he's still better than everyone else. But the underlying statistics point to a physical decline in LeBron James, who is so great and has such a broad base of skills that he can be an excellent player pretty much for as long as he wants to be. But is he still at his very best? No, he's not. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> Max Kellerman, you know, there are NBA folks who don't like you today. They don't like you at all because the argument against analytics, they view you as somebody who took a class on it, graduated from it. You understand? <laughs> Talked to the researcher, collaborated, got your numbers and all that stuff. Collaborate on this, bro. I, I know you did it. I know you did it, but I'm just saying that's how they view you right now. 
because you sound just like one of them. You see what I'm saying? Now, I take that as a compliment. Let me explain. Unlike a lot of old school NFL dudes, I believe there's a purpose that served with analytics. I remember that Pat Riley was using, I remember my man Jim Jackson, who you know played on various teams in the NBA, started Ohio State. That's my brother right there. That's my man. Love him to death. 24 you know, so points a, a game one year, maybe that, better that, than that. that, that yeah. That's right. He talked about how Pat Riley was doing analytics before any of us knew what it, it existed. So it's not new to a lot of these NBA folks, okay? It's just the reliance. It's, it's just the reliance on it that offends the old school guys. And even though I agree that it shouldn't be relied upon, I think it's something that should be respected. You're the first person that actually has me disgusted with, with analytics and that approach. Because you're looking at numbers and you're not contextualizing it. You're not putting it in its proper context and seeing what's going on with LeBron James. LeBron James literally has at least three elite years, if not four, left in him. Not to mention the fact I see no decline. And allow me to explain. You're not taking into account what he's had to deal with. More importantly, you're not taking into account the approach and the mentality that LeBron James has adopted years ago. He has been six straight NBA Finals. This guy has been the seven Finals overall. When you consider the amount of playoff activity he's had, it's basically added two seasons to his career. His mentality... Glad you agree with me. Time out. His mentality is, I know that I'm not judged by what happens in December and January and February and March. Yeah, I'm going to still average a minimum of 25 a game. You understand? Since my second year in the league, by the way, his, his averages have never dipped below 25, 7, and 7, ever, okay? So when they're talking about a dip, well, he averaged 27 one year, and then Molly, he went to 26.9. Then after that, he went to 25.8 or something like that. Are you kidding me? This is not what happened. What's going on with LeBron is this. LeBron has graduated. He has said, I know how I'm going to be judged. I don't have to worry about the regular season. Let me make sure we're one of the top two seats in my conference. Outside of that, do whatever I need to do to bring this team along and to make sure that I do what's necessary. His averages in this past NBA Finals was better in terms of percentages from the field, percentages from three-point range. It was better than it was in last year's NBA Finals. Why? Because this time he had Kyrie. Last year he did it. He had to carry the load all by himself offensively. So he's sitting there and nitpicking and picking his spots because he's saying, I don't need to do all of this. This is what I need to do. This is when I need to do it. That's not losing something. That's elevating immaturity and intelligence and recognizing why am I going to expend unnecessary to energy? Compensate, That's the point. To compensate. It's not to compensate. Look, is he still the best? He just it's not proved to compensate. it. Absolutely. To compensate, it's not to compensate for a physical decline. Can he still throw 100 miles Where's an the hour? Physical, where Absolutely, the physical yes. Where is the Okay, let's decline? go to the eyeball test. Because sure. if I bring up stats, you're going to accuse me of listen, doing listen, stats. Listen, then you'll listen, use listen, stats, but you, you should, use the wrong ones. You should win the eyeball test. Okay. You should win the eyeball test. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. All right. Let's look at, let's look. Does he close out on three-point shooters the way he used to consistently? Not consistently. No, doesn't no. have to. No. Does he shoot as well as he used to consistently? Um, excuse me. He fluctuates. There he is. He shot worse. Yeah. But no, there he is. But, he shot but worse. But he was ascending, and now he's descending in terms no, of three-point shooting. No. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. From a peak of over 40% from three. Something like that. Go ahead. Uh, in the 13, 14, 12, 13 I got campaigns, the numbers right, right in that me. area. Go ahead. The, the, but I'm not going to stay away from stats. I'm just going okay. to the eyeball test. Does he know how he's going to be judged and therefore shows maturity that the Warriors didn't last year when they're playing Steph Curry in, the, in overtimes against meaningless teams toward the end of the season when they basically had the whole thing wrapped up in the West already? Yes, he's more mature than all those guys. He knows, oh, let me take my foot off the gas. I need to pace myself mm -hmm. to keep that 100-mile-an-hour heater for when it matters the most. But there was a time, Stephen A., a couple of years ago where he didn't have to do that. He could put the pedal to the metal and dominate both ends of the floor, those back-to-back -back chips in Miami, both ends of the floor from wire to wire. That was the best LeBron James of all time. And this LeBron James is a wiser, more mature, also all-time great who's not quite physically what he once was then. That's why he's pacing himself. Let, let, before we go, 
Let me throw something by y'all here because I have the stats right in front of me and I know you were going eyeball test that particular moment in time. Don't blame me for that. Here's the deal. LeBron James, he shot 40% from three-point range in the 2012-2013 season. Okay. Prior to that, he was religiously in the 30s, 36, 33, 33, 34, 31, 31, etc. Mm -hmm. From that season... reverse chronology? No, 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 what I'm saying is before that and What was after, the season right before 40? 36. And what was the season before that? 33. Oh, okay, so he was getting better and better and better at three-point no, no. shooting. What I'm saying to you is this. Hovering, 31, yeah. 34. Then he went down to 33. Right. Then he came up to 36. Because he started studying the no, analytics no, no, and he no, figured no, out no. where to take the what, three what, from it. Made no, him a better no, no, shooter. No, no, no. What yeah. I'm trying to say to you is this. What he's doing from three-point range, even though last year was historically bad for him at 30.9, the point is that's where he usually is. No, that's where he used to no. be before he improved. No, no, no. no. He didn't improve Look that at the much. trajectory. You he proved my point. He, he got better, no, better, better, hit no, prime levels, no. and what? then declined. No. He went from 36 to 40 back down to 37, 35, 30. Right. You just showed. You proved my point. I'm he went saying, up, 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 peak, I'm down, down, down. You, I'm saying to you that where he's at that. right now, is what you know him to be. Back in the, the point, day, before, before his the, peak. Before you know him to be. At the end, he's physical. He's more, he's stronger, more powerful than Kobe MJ. And I look at no decline whatsoever. He's just smarter because he knows Father Tom just is described undefeated. the decline. You described the no. ascent and then the decline. I disagree. This is one of those debates that could go all day. No. We got to go to break. Okay. Oh, this card just got really good. I cannot wait. That was Conor McGregor speaking at MSG, where he will headline UFC 205 on November 12th against Eddie Alvarez. McGregor still talking about Floyd Mayweather, even though Floyd said last week he is ready to move on. Max, break it down for us. What is going on here? Uh, you know, you got to love Conor McGregor. He's the best talker who can fight. Yeah. Floyd's the best fighter who can talk. And, and, of course, so you put those two names together, it's a huge promotion. Here's what's going on. You ain't going to beat Floyd Mayweather in the ring if you're the same size as Floyd Mayweather. Triple G is bigger. There are guys who, you know, Vladimir Klitschko would beat Floyd Mayweather. He's a heavyweight. But if you're the same size as Floyd, you ain't going to beat him in the ring. You're also not going to beat him at the negotiating table. His entire career has proven that with networks, with other fighters. He's the best, and his team is the best at negotiating the best deal. So he gets the lion's share against anyone. Now, there are fighters who bring something to the table. Canelo Alvarez, you got to give him a piece. He, you know, he brings something. Uh, Manny Pacquiao brings a lot. You got to give him a big piece. Still, Floyd gets the lion's share. So here he is essentially negotiating with Conor McGregor. And Conor McGregor's like, uh-uh, time out. Go get me my hundred million. And Floyd's like, well, I, you know how this works? I'm the guy. I get the most money. <laughs> yeah. But here's where Conor has extra leverage that most Floyd opponents at this level don't. In, in, the, in the octagon, Floyd has a 0% chance to beat Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor would beat him easily, early, zero risk for Conor McGregor in the octagon against Floyd Mayweather. It is exactly the same in the ring for Floyd against Conor. Conor got no shot. That's easy money. That's easy work, as Floyd would say. So that's actually leverage for Conor. Because where else does Floyd Mayweather get to make an event that big where his opponent poses absolutely no in-the-ring risk. Very good point. And I think at some level, even Connor knows that. And so at the negotiating table, it's like, no, 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 no. You ain't going to get the lion's share. It's not going to be the percentage you think it is. Look how easy this night. I mean, like, you ain't going to find easier money than this. And I think Floyd also knows that at some level. And so the negotiation goes on. Floyd says, I'm walking away publicly because it seems to give him leverage. But Connor has plenty of leverage here. Here's where it gets interesting. You know, I told you Floyd called me the other night. I thought he was calling me to congratulate me because I'm going to be calling the Manny Pacquiao fight on November 5th. But he was actually... Congratulations, well, by yes, the way. That, that is going to so be must-see. Well, you know, I, oh, it, it I can't is. wait. I, I'm hoping I make you proud, brother. I'm you hoping will. I know you will. You do this already. This is my first time ever doing color commentary for a fight, so I'm, I'm going to be you're nervous. Gonna be uh, you're going to be great. But I'm looking forward to November 5th in Vegas at the Thomas & Mack Center. But let me say this. Floyd didn't call about that. He called about something else. But you know, since I had him on the phone, I took the liberty of asking him about this kind of great. He said, yeah, man, I called it off. He said, brother got to know his place. You know, I mean, wait a minute now. I'm all about my business. I'm in, I'm in this for business. You know, so it said to me that he really, he, he doesn't really want to retire. He's comfortable 
all right? Bought some new property in Times Square. He's going to be making seven figures a month for the rest of his life. I mean, he's Floyd is fine. He doesn't need anything. But he has no problems with making more money. You know, and you're absolutely right. He is about the business of making sure he's going to get the lion's share. But here's the thing about Floyd, and you can confirm this better than me. This is just the impression that I've gotten throughout the years communicating with him, Leonard Ellaby, and others. Floyd ain't the kind of dude that just wants to make his money and don't want you to make yours. He might hate promoters making theirs. He might hate, make the, hate the networks getting all, so much money, but he has no problem with a fighter getting money. I remember that I was with, I, I had spoken to Floyd after the weigh-in the night of, the night before he fought Pacquiao. He was so disgusted with Pacquiao because of the share that Bob Arum and Top Rank had ended up getting, you know, for Pacquiao's purse. You know, Pacquiao, you know, he owed them. I mean, borrowing money, all of this other stuff. It's too complicated to get into. But the point is, is that he's saying, we went through all of this to make sure you get this money. And there's still some of that money that you ain't getting. What the hell is wrong with you? He was talking about Pacquiao. Called them stupid. He was disgusted with Pacquiao. He respects Conor McGregor from the standpoint that he elevates the marketability, brings the dollars in, and he's not going to let Conor McGregor get more than him. But he has no problem with Conor McGregor getting his share so long as Floyd gets his own. And so I think when you look at it from that perspective, I think you have to look at it and appreciate it and understand that this is something that could potentially still happen. Because if Conor McGregor continues to smoke dudes in the UFC, it's a big deal that he beat Nate Diaz. Because that was at 170. He really fights at 145. 45, yeah. And so for him to move up 25 pounds, if he moves down but still dominates and steamrolls over everybody in his path, even though you and I both don't believe he could touch Floyd, the question is, what if he does touch him? You see what I'm saying? Because he what won't. The, I don't believe that either. In the boxing ring? I hey, I don't believe it either. Something else. Yeah. Floyd Listen, got no, no, no shot in the knockout. Floyd got no shot Connor in the knockout. Connor got no shot in the boxing. I totally agree with you. But what I'm saying is the, the mystique with boxing, there have been plenty of times, and I don't believe he touched Floyd. Well, I don't even think he'd get a headshot in. Right. Okay? But what I'm saying is the mystique of boxing, the intrigue, the allure of boxing is when you walk into a ring and you know if this person catches you. See, if Conor McGregor didn't have power, Plus, he was a UFC fighter coming to fight Floyd. Then we're wasting our time. But because he has knockout power, you do Here's find yourself asking, okay, what if this dude caught him? Now, I don't believe it Here's what the problem, happened, Stephen a. but that's the intrigue. Here's the problem. Just like I said, Conor McGregor has a lot of leverage here because it's easy work for Floyd and a huge payday. Mm -hmm. And so Conor's like, I want my piece. Um, Floyd also has leverage here because UFC ain't boxing where you can cherry pick. Right. Floyd has fought a lot of fighters, but he has also cherry picked in the higher weight classes. Right. But he was 130, 135. He fought everybody. Pounds, fought everybody. He fought everybody. As he got bigger, he waited to the right time where they represented minimal risk, maximum reward, which is what you're supposed Except to do. Except for Canelo, though. I don't Can, know well, Canelo is still ascending, yeah. but there's always an excuse for Floyd. Well, he, he, people are always, no matter what Floyd does, he'll be criticized. Right. He was too young, he was too old. Yeah. And yet, I am here saying that, in fact, I don't believe the outcome would be any different, but Canelo was 22. Pacquiao was older, and that fight was past its expiration date. Same thing with Shane Mosley, et cetera. Um, Floyd, as I say, has flipped the paradigm, along with Al Heyman, his manager, advisor, has flipped the paradigm in boxing, fighting, combat sports, is exploitation. We, the fans and the networks, exploit fighters. We want to see you in tough blood and guts. Forget about the fact that you're brain damaged later on in your career, right? Your kidneys don't work. But right now, we want to see you prove all that stuff. The fighter, on the other hand, is saying, no, wait a minute. A fighter's manager, rather. They're saying, we want the most money for the least risk. Right. I don't want to walk around brain damaged with bad kidneys later in my life. Right. I don't want to shorten life expectancy. So Floyd and Al Heyman have been so successful at flipping that paradigm, there's a backlash. Because they have out-negotiated the other side, meaning the networks and the fans, by so much that he's made hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars without taking the same risks that the fans wanted to see him take. And this is more of the same there. The risk for Connor is as follows. 
The UFC is not boxing. You can't get away with that. You got to fight world class fighter after world class fighter in their primes, whoever the biggest name is. Therefore, no one's going undefeated for too long. That's right. So if Connor continues to do this, he could lose. He could lose to Alvarez. He could lose. It's not that he's not excellent or even better than Alvarez. Wrong night, one split second mistake, you can lose that in the UFC. No question. So, so Connor's, so Floyd got leverage there. Like, if you lose a couple fights, it's not worth it anymore. Yes, right. You better strike while the iron's hot. Right, right, but Floyd don't mind catching cashing another nine-figure check, and that's what he's after. And one of the things that he did to accentuate that point was highlight how I'm busy getting on Oscar De La Hoya, Fahad and Canelo from Triple G. Mm -hmm. Floyd is like, man, I can't knock Oscar. And you know their history. Right. He's like, I can't knock Oscar. He said, that's smart business. Right. Good for him. Looking out for the fighter. Smart. The fighters' business interests and the fans' interests are usually diametrically opposed. Mm -hmm. They can't coexist you know, one wins where the other does. Stay tuned in the days and weeks to come. I'll have more info on Floyd. And it ain't about McGregor, but I'll touch on that another mm, time. I like that little tease there.